welcome to A Couple Reviews. I'm Hope. I'm Ian. And today we have a guest with us. He is one of the several friends of ours named Nick, so we call him by his last name. Is that fine? <laughs> welcome Nick Shutterly. Hello, everybody. So we call him Shots or Shutterly, um, as opposed to Nick, more often than not. Even though I was here first, the first Nick. You were, were you born first, or did you just know everyone first? I am the oldest. Okay. <laughs> the one true Nick. <laughs> <laughs> They're all just posers and interlopers. Of course. I mean, one of them's not even a Nick, really. Yeah. He's a William. Yeah. <laughs> true facts. But enough about that. Have at you. <laughs> so today we're going to cover Planescape Torment. This is a video game that came out in 1999 on December 12th, so the very end of 99. It has a 9 out of 10 on Steam, which is pretty goddamn good. <laughs> underrated. Um, Indeed. Hev- heavily underrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, came out for Windows. It's a, a computer game. The devs are Black Isle Studios, which I did no more research on beyond that name. Mm-hmm. Beamdog as well? Is that a publisher or is that the devs? Beamdog might be the publisher because it says for devs it's Black Isle. Okay. I believe they're the publisher, and also more recently of the Boulder's Gate Enhanced Edition. That was Beamdog nice. as well. Yeah, okay. and so the, the it, Planescape Torment uses the same engine. It's a modified version of the Infinity Engine, which was used in Baldur's Gate. Just Baldur's Gate 1 or Baldur's Gate 2? Shutterly, do you know if those were the same engine, or did they have a new engine for Baldur's Gate 2? I do not know offhand. Uh, I believe that there was some sort of advancement from Baldur's Gate 1 to 2, but I can't say with certainty. They came out pretty close to each other, though, within a year or two? I think so. 1 is probably like 96 or 97. I feel like Baldur's Gate 2 was 99 or 2000. Around okay. Time. Okay, cool. So Shutterly played it first, who recommended it to Ian, and then Ian played it, and then he said that I had to play it. Because, You're welcome. Quote, yes, yes, thank you. Because, quote, it is the best story of any video game you've ever best played. Best written video game of all time. It's like playing a book, almost, is the way I describe it. Yeah, that's definitely fair. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Shutterly, how did you come to um, Planescape? Like, was it recommended? Did you stumble across it? It was my older brothers. Uh, we, we grew up together playing mostly the same sort of RPG-centric games like Diablo 2 and uh, before that Baldur's Gate 1, which I think remains either my first or second favorite game of all time, kind of swaps places with Torment. Um, Again, mostly just because of the merits of the story. I, I do concur that it's probably one limiting factor, one weakness that makes it less accessible to more people apart from just being ancient, is the uh, the outdated combat system, which definitely could use some work. Uh, Baldur's yeah, it's Gate, pretty heinous. Yeah, went through sort of the same thing, where at least they had a more fleshed-out combat system that was further refined in the Enhanced Edition, which is like the last five, four or five years. I forget when exactly that was released. But yeah, they, they kind of recognize that. It's not, it's not a combat-focused game, and that's fine, because there are only like three or four maybe required fights that cannot be avoided in the game, uh, in Torment. All the others can be navigated through dialogue or simply running or through manipulation, like magic, things like that. So it's, uh, it is probably the biggest weakness, but not at all discounting it. A little aside is that uh, Larian Studios, the devs that did uh, Divinity Original Sin 2, which has got Im- insane praise uh, and still does, has a great combat system that would work really well for these games. And they are actually, uh, the next Baldur's Gate game is actually in their hands. So that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is exciting to see what they're going to do with that. Cause it seems like they'll do it, uh, do it justice. Mm-hmm. So Charlie, does that mean that you played it around like 99, 2000 time, or did you come to it like even later than that? Around that time. It was probably a year or two later. Uh, we so were it was generally... pretty new when you came to so it. So you'd be like 12 yeah. years old. Yeah, um, yeah, right around that time, right before high school, I'd say, uh, before World of Warcraft sunk its claws into me, um, <laughs> becoming one of my other favorite games of all time. Again, mm-hmm. the RPG focus. Uh, but yeah, Torment. I even as a child, I immediately appreciated it. Even though this is the sort of game I think that's better. Um, I would say that it draws adults and just generally more mature people into it better so than a than a child because there's so much 
more to it again than just combat and kind of bullying your way through the game. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, again, like playing a book almost. There is a lot of reading that needs to be done to really understand the entire story and all the different characters and how they interact together. A lot of things that can be easily missed if you have a shorter attention span like most children do. Um, yeah. So I would, I mean, I would definitely say it's more Even if you're looking for all the secrets, uh, there's still so much. You'll, mm-hmm. you'll almost definitely miss so much your first almost playthrough. Definitely. Yep. And you, I know you've replayed it. Um, I think Leslie said she's replayed it three or four times. A handful, yeah. Uh, yeah so, my my so wife, Leslie, well. she, uh, who's currently working beside me right now, she, um, <laughs> she's played it just twice, I believe, from start to finish. And mm-hmm. we revisit it. We were actually just talking the other night about revisiting it again. It's the sort of game that you come back to frequently, I would think. Um, Baldur's Gate, Torment, Neverwinter Nights, all these games have near infinite replayability i would say just because of their their very design that you can play a different character or incarnation if you will uh, mm-hmm. virtually every playthrough you can be anything from a, a good aligned warrior to an evil aligned mage or a thief and something in between uh, there's many different companions to interact with you can always have a different party composition each of your companions will have different dialogues based on who they're interacting with so again, it has near infinite replayability and keeps it fresh every. Uh, yeah, and the fact that there's there's no way you can catch everything your first playthrough. Exactly. Um, yep. Ian you, you had find something new every time. Yeah, Ian had we had a character. Um, we had Nordrum, Nord Nordum. Yeah, Nordum. It's just mm-hmm. Nordum. Modron, Modron backwards. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, who Ian didn't have his playthrough and had heard about later. Uh, because you go in very spoiler free generally for most mm. games. Mm-hmm. I knew he was in the game, but I didn't look up anything the first time through, and I, I never thought I, uh, yeah, I completely forgot to go back to where I could find him, and uh, so never ended up getting him. So our playthrough, we did. But at the yeah. same time, in our playthrough, somehow we missed uh, Valor. Yeah, of the what are there six or seven companions? Uh, two of them are. I would mm-hmm. say very easily missed. All of the others you'll either be introduced to early or frequently throughout the game. Some of them are just impossible to miss. Uh, but again, it, it is the sort of game that you really want to play multiple times so that you can accommodate every party member and see mm-hmm. what they have to offer and how they interact with others. I, I yeah. typically play these games with sort of the same party generally, uh, maybe with like one rotating slot, your party of five or six, depending on the game you're playing. Um, I just have my favorites, and I have my favorite way to play. It's the way I have, I'm most familiar with, and I have the most fun with. So I generally play with the same core group of adventurers and then rotate uh, every playthrough one slot just to kind of seal What's the things your core that I've missed. Yeah. So, Who are your uh, people? So it has been a while. Torment, is is that five companions or is that six? Uh. That you it can would travel be... with. Five, five, six, seven. No, you can in, travel, in your party. You can travel with five because there's seven, which and there's two you can't. You have to lose two. That's okay. right. So That's it's a party of six, including the, mm-hmm. yeah, so five so companions. So five, five companions. Mm-hmm. I would always, always recommend traveling with both Mort and Dacon. Um, mm-hmm. They're probably the two easiest to find and most unavoidable party members in the first place. But they have the most to offer in terms of developing your character, um, and his memories, I think they have the largest impact on you as a character. And so I would always recommend starting any group with them. They're also very powerful companions and mm-hmm. good at what they do. So Especially very, Mort. Yeah, Mort's yes. such a good tank. He's just, <laughs> yep. yeah, the yeah, taunt he'll, he'll ability be best is unmatched. Yeah. <laughs> Can't trust him, uh, but best friends. <laughs> indeed, yes. Don't trust the skull. Uh, apart from those two, uh, there are two female companions in the game, both Anna and Fall from Grace. Mm-hmm. which you can have something of a romance with either, but not both. And it's very different in how they play out, but both of them seem to be vying for the attention of the nameless one. And so it's uh, an interesting interaction if you do decide to travel with both. Uh, I would personally just travel with one, however. Do you have a, a favorite over the other? I prefer Fall from Grace. Uh, she's <gasps> sort of a clerical here. She, for those that aren't aware, she's a, a succubus or a tanari. But she's um, a healer. So and, we'll, yeah. and we'll go into the details of each character one of by one mm-hmm. uh, later on in the podcast. Right. Yeah. Uh, so Anna is sort of a thief and Fall from Grace is a cleric. Again, this is a game that's not really combat focused. So a cleric, they're not as critical typically as most mm-hmm. RPGs, games that require a healer. Um, 
So Anna, I think, has more utility throughout the game. She'll let you do more and explore more. But I would still prefer Fall from Grace just because of her character. Uh, she's a very interesting kind of uh, dichotomy a, a dual of nature. a character. Yeah, that, that is. I was not sure if that was the word I was looking for, but it in fact was. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I would agree. I, I think she's just more interesting. And I always, when I'm playing as my character, I always see myself more identifying with her as a personality. I would be more keen to travel with a person like her as opposed to Anna. I am the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Anna bit me and I bit her back and I was like, this is for real true love. (laughs) Very chaotic (laughs) of you. Yes. Um, I actually, we, we have both, both women um, because I, I like, I like Grace a lot. um, Mm -hmm. We didn't really do much romance with either one, honestly. Well, no, we didn't do much romance. Slightly more with Anna, but definitely more with Anna. Like, I mean, it's definitely clear by the end of the game that like you and Anna are in some kind of relationship with each other, at least mm-hmm. emotionally. And they talk to themselves sort of behind your back as well, especially like Mort. Mort and Anna are, I think, two of the funniest mm-hmm. characters that interact with each other. Uh, but yeah, they they will talk about you, the player, the nameless one, um, as if he's not there, and that's always very entertaining and interesting to see so, how that develops. Yeah, so apparently the game has 72 lines of unique banter mm-hmm. between that. characters. Um, that sounds about right. But you don't experience most of them in a single playthrough because they're pretty rare. Yeah. They're ra- they, they happen semi-randomly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, different um, conditions that will trigger uh, certain triggers that need to be met in order for a dialogue to play. And even then, you'll, exactly. you'll miss out on most of them. There's mm-hmm. actually... Um, an add-on that makes it so they happen way more often. So mm-hmm. you're just about guaranteed to get all banter in one game, which I might, you know, if I play through again, I might the have that time. on just so I can For experience sure. all of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah. Cause like Mort will like, Mort has like a crush on grace kind of. He has a crush on uh, everybody. He, yeah. Well, everybody yeah. Female. Every yeah. female <laughs> he has a crush on, but he has like more of a acceptable crush. It seems like on grace and like, Yes. I think he initially kind of likes Anna because she's a lady, but mm-hmm. she has no time for his bullshit. So he's like, she, well, she is more too. feisty. Yeah, I love exactly. her. No time for him. She <laughs> does teach him some very um, practical abilities. Actually, she strengthens him as a character by teaching mm-hmm. him taunts. That yeah. is a mechanic of Mort's. So mm-hmm. that is uh, something I to like keep that mechanic. In mind. That's yeah. That I think yeah. <laughs> was one of my, the first things in the game. I I realized was a thing, and I immediately really liked it. Was like there uh, is it Dinar's ghost? No. Who's the ghost you meet in the mortuary? The Steinar. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. she and Mort can have like a like a like a face off of words. Can they? I think so. Is it? It was no. So, I, I no. think it's when you first meet Anna. No, it's before, before Anna. It was a, a ghost in, in the mortuary, and I like cut off their like fighting. You're like, if you let him like argue with someone, <laughs> it actually makes his taunts better. Oh yeah. And I was like, that's well, that, genius. That, there's a there's a number of times that that can happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I always. Clement- Once I knew it was a thing, I was like, well, just Clemency let them go. Clemency Adder Tongue is one out. of them. You can yeah. definitely get some from her. <laughs> yeah, it's, I thought that was such a, f- a funny and smart way to like let that, imp- let, the, let that improve on Mort while not actually having to like really do anything other than let it happen mm-hmm. as a player. Um, yeah, I'd be surprised if that were an interaction that he has with Dianara just because of how she's, she's sort of a more gentle ghost. So I'd be surprised if she's sad. in like a... Yeah, in it's, in some, it's of, someone uh, in the mortuary. It's some, like, ghost or creature. Mm-hmm. So, Charlie recommended the game to Ian because yep. of Incredible Storyline, one of his favorite games, as he has said. And then you played it on your own before you, I kind of came in. Yep. Um, do you want to talk about that experience at all? Um, I actually... I had some trouble getting into the game. I started it, played it for a number of hours, and then... Um, just never really got back to it. And then eventually restarted the game from the beginning because it had been so much time. And then that that time it stuck. Um, and I think what really slowed me down is the game really shows its age in terms of mm-hmm. gameplay. It is just it is just difficult to get into for some people. Um, but once it, once I once it really clicked with me, um, you know, I was hooked. Yeah, yeah, I remember, I think I remember either, I can't remember if it was your first time you played through and you were just like, oh, that's really good, and then you fell out of it, or if it was the second time when it hooked you, but you were just like, 
This is really good. <laughs> <laughs> and Just as far curious. as versions go, yeah. Enhanced Edition, the one on Steam, mm-hmm. is actually really good. Usually Good Old Games has the superior versions. Is that what we have? Which one? No, we have the Steam version. Okay. Um, and I'm sure the Good Old Games version is good as well. But for once, the Steam version actually has a really good version. <laughs> Out of curiosity, what was the point at which you stopped playing the first time? Was it the Catacombs by any chance? Um, catacombs or catacombs. sooner. It, <laughs> I think it was post catacombs. Hmm. Okay. So she made it through that. But yeah, there are a couple it, of low points throughout the game. I think the, cata- <laughs> the catacombs is probably what wore me down, and I mm-hmm. like finished the catacombs and probably could not continue after that. Like it, that's probably what broke my spirit. Yeah. yeah. I feel like we really. I feel like we kind of you kind of not rushed us, but we really just kind of did what we needed to do in the catacombs so that we could move on. It felt like mm-hmm. it. Whereas a lot of other areas, we kind of we linger and we once you poke get into the dead, stuff. Once you get into the dead nations, I think dead nations is actually interesting. I love dead. Oh yeah, nations. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's one of my but favorite it's the parts of the le- yeah. Leading up to it is just gar. Well, not garbage, but not the, gar- with the we- but like one of the weakest parts of the whole game. And mm-hmm. it should be said, some of the most combat heavy. Yeah. yeah. If you don't, if you don't want to just run away from all the creatures, it's some of the most combat heavy. And actually, some of the zones require you to kill the creatures to. At least some of the rooms, like the Vargul room, mm-hmm. require you to fight them to to claim its treasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, and then and then after you beat it, you said, you know, to me, saying basically the same thing Charlie has always said, which is that it's the best story of a game you've ever played. Mm-hmm. So I had to pl- I had to be involved because stories are my everything to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so we played it the same way that we play a lot of games like this. Same way we played Mass Effect, um, which is that Ian is kind of in control of the character and does all the combat. And for this, instead of a mouse, I had my we had an extra keyboard for some reason, and I had that, and I made all the dialogue choices. So it was essentially my character. But it, as always, you and I, Ian and I, talk about um, mm-hmm. pretty much all the decisions, especially the bigger ones. And we largely would make the similar decisions. Yeah, you and I play very similarly in our character types. I think. Mm-hmm. I think. Let's see. Uh, as far as our party makeup, the only difference is that we subbed out. In my playthrough, I kept Ignis, uh, and you subbed out Nordum for Ignis. Mm-hmm. And then, did you have Valia? Uh, yeah, I did find Valia. I found mm-hmm. all the characters except Nordum in okay. my playthrough, but I did not have Valia join my party. You had, when I when you mentioned when we were getting near the game, Ian was like, "Oh, we we missed one," and I was like, "Oh, would I have liked them?" And you were like, "He's very <laughs> like lawful good." And I was like, "Well, then I don't want him anyway." He's interesting. <laughs> um, let's actually cover him last as we mm-hmm. go through characters mm-hmm. um, because we missed him. But Shutterly, you, you you enjoy yeah. him as a character quite a bit, right? I not like for maybe the same reason that you. You would. Uh, I. He has a secret. I'll say that Ooh. I am very intrigued by and in how it plays into the nature of your main character. Um, but he is. He is fairly one dimensional. He's actually. I believe he's lawful and neutral, and he's pretty much yeah. like strict adherence to yeah, he's a single true lawful. Mm. Yeah, to a I single find thought. That very boring. <laughs> yeah, I find his, it very boring. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. before we get to, before we get to him, let's. You want to just go down the list of uh, characters, characters. Ma- or party members you would meet, probably pretty much in order that you would meet them. First let's, off, yes, but let's start with your the player character, the nameless I, one. Yeah, the very first character. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I had to wake up from the dead in a place like this. Impossible to miss him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. you are him. <laughs> <laughs> um, this game does like kind of immediately throw you into it, which I actually always like. Um, you wake up in the mortuary and you're like. Well, this is weird. The mortuary is actually a really good, like, uh, starter quote unquote, zone. yeah, tutorial zone, mm-hmm. starter mm-hmm. zone, because there's there's a lot there, and it's you can, interesting. You can spend like an hour plus mm-hmm. just uh, finding all the little secrets in the mortuary. I think mm-hmm. our first, because we do like, we do like um, playthrough sections is the word. What's that one? Sessions. We do little playthrough sessions together. Obviously, we didn't play this game in one sit there. That would be insane. That would um, be. And I don't even know if we got out of the mortuary our first our first session. I don't. I don't think, think we, we did. did. No, you can spend a lot of time. I mean, there. we definitely played for like an hour and a half or something. Mm-hmm. So I it's think we spent timely. about thirty something hours total. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for the to beat the game 
because we didn't we didn't clock it, but Ian's played it twice now, and Steve mm-hmm. tells us how long we've played it. So we just basically split it in half, with a little bit more on your end, I guess. I I played it a full playthrough and then some, mm-hmm. and then we played a full playthrough, and that so so about thirty hours. Which honestly, mm-hmm. it feels like a lot longer because it's so dense. Mm-hmm. Um, and the game can be kind yeah. of broken into multiple chapters. And Mm -hmm. some parts will flow much faster than others. But again, if you decide to sort of linger and interact with all the NPCs and even as early as the mortuary, there's a lot of additional un, not required or uh, unnecessary content there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, I consider it necessary and I, I seek it out every time I play just because of how it expands your knowledge of the world, such as like the rule of three, things like that, that come into play. Um, kind of educate you as to how the the universe that you're playing in functions. Do you mm-hmm. want to uh, explain the rule of three? Yeah, sure. Uh, I I don't think it's limited to just to torment. Um, it's like a fantasy, a common fantasy trope. A lot of things that uh, kind of borrow from each other, um, meaning that things happen in threes. Generally, it's like three is a number of significance, um, like a trinity, or you know. That, that rings throughout many different games and fantasy universes, but especially in Torment to the point that uh, it's like a, like a law of the universe. Um, mm-hmm. And it should be noted that this is the, sa- this is the same planar verse that Baldur's Gate and uh, Neverwinter Nights as well, right? Yeah, I would think so. Um, so well, yeah, Neverwinter is the same universe as Baldur's yeah, Gate. The yeah. Forgotten yeah, Realms yeah. and Farron. It takes place in the the hive of Sigil, which is sort of like a gateway plane. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget generally what its alignment is. I think it's considered like a, a true neutral plane because it can take I you. So. Yeah, it can take you literally anywhere in the universe. Uh, the city of doors, uh, where actually another kind of interesting point that comes up frequently is that almost anything can take you anywhere. If mm-hmm. you have the right key, which could be like something a humming a song to yourself or a piece of some material in your pocket that you rub at a certain time, you can open a plane, a planar door to infinite possibilities. Which again, which I think makes is the place pretty a awesome. pretty unfriendly place to live, honestly. Oh, yeah. But mm-hmm. interesting because you have literally creatures and beings and people and stuff from all over the multiverse. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yep. And that kind of mm-hmm. helps the player especially if you're someone like me who doesn't do D&D, isn't, you know, um, drenched in all of this information. Uh, it explains the world to me in a really clear way and, that's interesting. And having it not set in, like, the prime material plane makes it so you're not expected to know everything. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if you were dropped off in Baldur's Gate, I mean, you should know what goblins are. You should mm-hmm. know what, you know, the way magic works in the universe. Being in Sigil... You're not really expected to understand how anything works there. And then being the nameless one as the player, you don't you don't have to come in with any knowledge because the nameless one doesn't fucking know anything. Yeah. yeah. All you need to know is do not cross the Lady of Pain. And, and they tell you that very quickly. <laughs> so, <laughs> who we didn't meet. Can you meet her? You, you can. certainly can. Yeah, but I think, I think you kind of have to fuck up pretty hard for her to <laughs> cross paths with you and... So sort of, uh, there's two ways you can meet her. One in which she slays you um, mercilessly, just kind of tears you down in the street. And another where she'll imprison you in a maze, which you can kind of consider as like a additional content. It's not required in any way, but you get a little bit of insight into, uh, might be getting ahead of ourselves as far as like the nameless one and his mm-hmm. nature of previous incarnations. But you actually get to see that this is not the first time that the lady has imprisoned your character. <laughs> Literally, you think you've been mazed in the past? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I, I believe it's the, the paranoid. The we paranoid didn't see her. Did you see her at yours? No, we, we never got we we never her. got mazed. <laughs> you do have to make a conscious effort to do it. Um, for those that are unaware of the Lady of Pain, she does not like to be prayed to, despite being uh, a deity of some mm-hmm. sort. It's kind of unclear what exactly she is, but she's the one that holds this city of infinite doors and interacting with every imaginable plane of existence altogether keeps things yeah. from breaking apart. So she's very powerful, clearly. And mechanically, she's actually one of the few things that can end your game, um, which we'll get to, I'm sure, shortly, as far as the immortality <laughs> We can get curse. to that right now. That's, yeah. that's one of the main mechanics of the game, is that uh, death is not permanent. Because Almost you, ever. Yeah, because the nameless one mm-hmm. is like cursed with immortality. Mm-hmm. 
So normal death just brings you back to the mortuary, and you can continue from there. Uh, but there are a few and far between uh, chances to achieve true death, <laughs> where you are d- destroyed beyond any <laughs> <laughs> any type of resurrection. Yeah, and they handle that. At which point, that. you just have to reload a game. But yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you're right. Um, there is a one moment, like late, pretty decently late in the game, where someone like offers you money to kill you because they want to. I think because she just wants to kill someone. Oh, that's not even that late in the game. That's like as oh, no, soon as you right. enter the Civic Fest Hall. Yeah, and I was mm-hmm. just like, "All right, sure," because it doesn't matter. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a few times in the game you can flex on people by just dying, and I love it. That's a weird flex, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really neat party trick. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> hey, check this out. <laughs> um, so the nameless one is the player character, and he's no memory. Mm-hmm. Um, wakes up in the mortuary. He's got, like, uh, writing tattoos on his back. Well, kind of all over his body, but... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, the the most legible of which on his back, and, but a number of other tattoos all over his body. And then he's covered in, like, really deep, gnarly scars, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Essentially from getting killed. Several times. Many, many, many times. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of, I mean, I guess the basic, basic plot of the game is, like, why are you immortal? Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting enough plot to get it going. And... Yeah, that that's pretty much the whole plot is why are you immortal and what did your previous incarnations do? Like mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. impact did you leave on the world? Mm-hmm. Which is a really fun way to think of when you're playing this game, as we talked about earlier, how it's nigh infinitely replayable. Uh, those are all your previous incarnations. Um, how many times have you existed in an entirely different body, a different character? And then every mm-hmm. time you play the game subsequently, it's a new incarnation to me anyway. Yeah. Um, and when you wake up, it's a, is it immediately when you wake up you get Mort? Yeah, he's there. He, he's the first first interaction with anybody in the universe. He comes uh, floating. He's a floating skull. <laughs> Floats right up to you and uh, immediately befriends you. Yep. And he, uh, something that happens right away is something that happens with most of the main characters and definitely all the party members is mm-hmm. that their first line with you is always voice acted. So you immediately mm-hmm. get a sense of the way they should sound. And that, I, mm-hmm. I really like that because even though there's not voice acting for 99% of the game, when they set up these characters with voice acting, it immediately sets up the way you read it inside your head for the rest of the game. Definitely. And I think that that's yeah. really a really strong choice. And all the part. voice acting is really well done. Yes. They, they picked a phenomenal cast of uh, voice yeah. actors. Um, yep. Yeah. All the way from uh, Valor, who's a walking suit of armor, to... to uh, Mort, you'll you'll recognize these actors almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my and personal favorite, Tony J, of course. Who does Tony J do? The transcendent one. Um, probably others as well, but one of the most significant. I don't know how yeah. much you want to get into the spoilers. <laughs> or we won't cover the transcendent one yeah. at all. No. Right. Yeah. He, his he, exist- he features his existence. His existence is not a spoiler, but his nature <laughs> is a spoiler. Yeah. Um, Mort is. Mort feels like a New Yorker, in a, <laughs> it, like an old Jewish New Yorker in a way that I'm like, I was immediately okay with. Like, I immediately liked. <laughs> uh, yeah. Whoa, hey, whoa, calm down, Chief, will you? Come on, we don't need this kind of trouble. For a lot of the game, he seems just kind of like almost comedic relief, mm-hmm. uh, which is a nice thing to have. And then like nearing the, I don't know, two thirds point of the game, he really has a twist where oh, he's much, much deeper of a character than you expected. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're not going to cover that, because spoilers. Yep. But <laughs> essentially, he's a floating skull. Uh, he knows quite a bit about Sigil. He's your first introduction to... He, yeah, he's like an encyclopedia for you in, in some ways. Essentially, yeah. yeah. He even um, claims to be... Uh, what's the word? Um M I M I R. Mimir, I think. It comes from uh, Norse mythology, I believe, who, uh-huh. I don't know if he was a deity or something to that effect, but a font of knowledge and um, actually kind of plays well into his character. And uh, he was beheaded, but his head lived on with all the knowledge contained in, within. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of fits with the, with the actual character. 
Oh, totally. <laughs> so he's kind of your he's your guide as well as uh, mechanically the most right. important combat <laughs> character. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's your just tank. He's your taunts. He's your slattern. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just love the idea of like a skull floating around and a powerful wizard conjuring a spell to destroy you, and then a, a skull floats up, swears at him, and slattern. Immediately stops casting and sprints <laughs> at the skull to bash him. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do sound clips for all the characters in our in, in the review show, and like Mort is going to be the hardest one to narrow down to like one voice clip. Oh, yeah, no. you'll, you'll have to do several for him. I'm sure he's got too many good lines to choose from. He has yeah, a lot of good yeah. ones. Oh, you alley bred dog! Choke on a bone, you witless ape! You know, if I'm gonna slam my eyeballs against you one more second, I'm gonna puke. And then, who do you who do you think you usually meet next? Dakon, right? I'd say Dakon is you, well, usually who you would meet next, either I Anna believe, or Dakon. I believe that you meet Anna, but not as a joinable party member. That's fair. Yeah, you meet Anna um, before you get to have her yeah. in your party, mm-hmm. like almost immediately. She she's a rogue or a thief of sorts, so you'll see her kind of, uh, you know. Slying around about. town, yeah, skulking about, <laughs> uh, but she will not join you for some time. Dakon, I think she, will. I think she's the first opportunity to upgrade Mort's taunt is just to let them argue it out. I, I think it. so too. Yep, I love it. Um, I guess we'll cover Dakon because you get him in the party next. Endure, in enduring, grow strong. And he is a gifted era. Yes, thank mm-hmm. you. Which is. How do you how how do you explain what that is? Because that's not a word I'm familiar with. Um, the Gith are outworlders from Limbo. Uh, Limbo is a plane, just like many many planes. I think it's a true neutral plane. Am I correct? It's yeah, it's very heavily neutral. Maybe to that point, to true true neutrality. I'm not exactly familiar. Um, and the I, only way that matter exists in Limbo is by, uh, I guess, concentration. Yeah, thought and, and meaning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Psychic for power. so for the gift to exist no. to exist in limbo, they must like have an understanding. They call it a, a knowing mm-hmm. of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he has a, a slightly interesting way of talking. I mean, everyone really has their own way of speech, which is kind of nice. Mm-hmm. That yeah, it, no very, one sounds very, very memorable. Um, I made a comment before, which I think is true as ever, that some of these games, the voice acting is so key to the character that you can even years later, I haven't played Torment in several years, but all the way back to the beginning, uh, you can remember exact lines of dialogue, the very... Like, like his, in- especially his level up yeah. silent one. No, yep. and in knowing, grow strong. Strong. Yeah. Like the exact intonation, even, it makes such an impression on you. You can almost recite it verbatim in the same inflection and way that the actor did. It's just, just a little nice detail, I think, that it speaks to you. It's, even yeah, this game is... As like awful kind of as the combat is and how it and it shows its age and all of that, like it's really polished for the time. Mm-hmm. And it's still a lot of that mm-hmm. polish is still there. And the voice acting is a big part of it, it, I think. It's like spell effects were I think actually way ahead of their time. I would much rather watch uh, like a barrage of force missiles or something or fire and ice from Torment than from Baldur's Gate, which came years later. Um yeah. I, I don't know why they they put a lot of their budget into the spell animations, I guess, but mm-hmm. there, there are things that could have been done. Lo- some of the spells are like fully three D rendered. It's it's almost like their own cutscene. Mm-hmm. Yep, all the level nine spells, I believe, are have like a cutscene that it it literally cuts away, and you get to watch a a cannon from Mechanus, a different plane yeah. of existence. It takes like three like thirty seconds to a minute to wind up, and then fires a laser beam that you know then <laughs> does an impressive amount of damage, but. This, all this unnecessary animation for, for <laughs> yeah, a single I think, casting. I think the first time we saw like a spell cut scene was when we were in the um, Modron cube. Mm-hmm. And when you fight like the, the big bad at the end of that. Um, I'm putting quotes around big bad because it's a it's a mini D&D-esque game in mm-hmm. the middle of a it's regular game. It's the most game. D&D <laughs> part of the entire thing. It's, it's intended yeah. to be a randomly generated D&D dungeon. It's really cute. But the like the big bad guy does like that cannon spell or whatever, and it, the, and it's the first time that I saw a spell where it cut away and it cut away to show the mm-hmm. cannon thing, and I was like, "What is happening? What is happening? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> the, where uh, are we?" The game. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. It's, it's I mean, just about one shot the character that it hit. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was it. Was very upsetting for me. I mean, and um, 
There's also for another slight weird cutscene moment. Um, we were talking to some guy who sold things, and I was just asking him questions, and then suddenly, like the cutscene of like the Lady of Pain's like splash screen type of, type of thing comes up, and we oh, were, the, that's the waiting screen. If yeah. you wait. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then something was like, what happened? Why did we wait? And it was because <laughs> this guy talked for like eight full hours. And we lost time. <laughs> yeah, it's the, uh, <laughs> the, the headstone shop. Mm-hmm. The coffin shop. Yeah, and I was mm-hmm. just like, what is happening? Um, and the con has um, a whole, um, I guess you would call it a religion, like aspect to him that you the player can yeah, the get teachings involved in. of zerthamon the mm-hmm. unbroken circle of zerthamon yeah. which um kind of tells like the history of his people yep. yeah the, well that definitely the, his, the history of his his people and the relig- the main religion mm-hmm. um he's a gith zerai and i can't actually remember the name of the other gith gith yonki uh good yeah, yeah, yeah nice and um essentially it, it talks about their rise and then the split of his people, mm-hmm. um, and there's there's yeah there's actually a lot you can learn from that. It's one of the most interesting um, character specific things. Yeah, really. absolutely. Yep, that's why I would always take him to to follow that plot all the way through. He's yep. always in my party for that reason. Yep. I think yep. only as a mage can you actually access the the end of that arc. Sort of. I was about to ask: is it is it intelligence li- limited or is it wisdom limited? I believe it's an, an intellect is required at a certain point to advance, um, but that's the beauty of this game, that you can literally play all roles. You can sort of respec from mm-hmm. a warrior into a thief, into a mage, almost on a whim. And, yeah, uh, and so, really at like, yeah, any know, part of the game, too. Yep, different trainers that will allow you mm-hmm. to do that. Yeah, we became a mage and stuck to a mage. We got it from Olmabeth. Olmabeth? Yep. 10 out of 10, Olmabeth. Yep. Old yeah, yep. I like her little. I like her little story where you become a mage, and I like her all the way through the game. In her little hut. She remains mm-hmm. relevant actually through the whole game. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah. As the plot unravels, it does. Uh, I will also say that um, there is no one way, no right way to play the game. Mm-hmm. But to me, I think a, a good aligned mage will allow you to see most of the game. Like, yeah, you can play a warrior or a thief, and either just stealth past all the major encounters or brute force your way through fight everything you can but a mage with a, a keen intellect and a sharp mind with high wisdom high wisdom high intelligence mm-hmm. Wis- wisdom is the most doesn't matter what you're playing wisdom is the most important stat in the game it makes you level faster and it allows you to to know the most that you would otherwise miss so definitely for your first playthrough you really want to kind of stick to that kind of thing. And then you can have fun with the game and break it in your own Because unlocking way memories is pretty much the most important plot mechanic that can happen in the game. And mm-hmm. a lot of it is memory right. or uh, it, wisdom. Yeah. Again, it's like playing a book, but with certain chapters that are locked behind a, a wisdom that some something in the game happens and it triggers a memory if you have the wisdom to recall it. Mm-hmm. And that that's the best part of the entire game is unlocking all those memories. Yeah. yeah. He's one of the uh, most interesting characters ever created because he's been around forever. He's also one of the most powerful characters, but you won't know that without a sufficiently high wisdom. And you meet him in a bar. Oh, I think he's talking about the... Oh, the nameless about the one. Nameless talking one. about the nameless one. Okay. Yeah. I thought you meant yeah. Dakon, I was like... But Dakon know. is one of the most interesting ones, and yeah, you meet him in a bar, <laughs> and he does inexplicably join you, but I guess you kind of you kind of write it off, because you're like, well, mm-hmm. it, that's an RPG trope that mm-hmm. each follows mm-hmm. you, but... They force their way yeah. into your party, but yep. he, he yep. has a reason to. He has a reason. Yeah. Yep. I mean, same with Mort. Same with Mort. You wake up to him. Mm-hmm. Um... So your next one that you would probably have join your party, Anna, also, Anna it, most likely. To cut Go in, ahead. if it wasn't made clear, uh, while Mort is sort of like a more tanky a warrior type or a fighter, uh, a Gazera, Dakon, is a blend of a fighter and a mage. So he does. He is your first mm-hmm. like real exposure to spells and magic in the game, but he also has a two-handed blade that he can kind of shape with his mind. So he's more of an offensive warrior, whereas Mort's more defensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would... if. I don't know how you would make this a film or anything like that. That would be very complicated and a lot of work. <laughs> but I would love to see just a con sword and how that would be handled mm-hmm. with the way it's it kind of like moves. It's like a special liquid metal sort of that, yeah. like, like Terminator-esque, it can be shaped based well, on his it, needs. 
it's made from the stuff that Limbo's made of, right? Right, yeah. That sort of psionic material. Mm-hmm. All so the that more powerful, very D&D. Right. The more he knows himself, the more uh, more knowing that he has, the more power he has over his his nature, his blade. Next up is my favorite character, Anna. <laughs> of course. Goldward, also known as Wanker City. I love her. Mm-hmm. Um, you meet her early on, like we talked about, and then um, you kind of, she kind of gets told to join you, right? Like her dad, her quote unquote dad, because he's not her birth father. Well, she gets her. she gets told to take you to a certain place, but once you get there, she she just sticks around, and um, as the game progresses, yeah, you um, as you get closer to it's that that's essentially the main reason she sticks around is because the nameless one, no matter the incarnation, has a certain presence over people. It seems. Particularly over women. <laughs> Not, well, yeah, especially over women, but over everybody. I it's mean, true. he's very like he, he he comes off as almost having like an insane amount of char- like charismatic. Yeah, like, except mm-hmm. except for perhaps the paranoid incarnation. But even the paranoid incarnation kind of gets whatever he wants mm-hmm. if he really sets his mind to it. Mm-hmm. Slight uh, spoilers. Mm-hmm. I'd say that. I'd say that she probably has the the least amount of depth in terms of backstory. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anna? It doesn't. Yeah, Anna. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like she's been around that long. She, um, she's pretty young. So yeah, compared to like De- Decon or like Mort. Yeah, it's pretty clear she hasn't interacted with a you know at least that many of your incarnations, if any. You know, mm-hmm. as as you progress through the game, mm-hmm. um, she's interesting, but. Um, not not the deepest. It seems like more so her story is how like things happening around her and this current time as opposed to a background history. Yeah, she's she's the most involved with this current timeline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that generally rounds out like the core of your party, I would think. You travel with those four mm-hmm. for most part of the game. And then once you get to like six, seven companions, you might start dropping one of them. But uh, I find that you probably spend the majority of your game with Mort, Dakon, and Anna kind of. Yeah together and we finished our game with them so they yeah. never left us yeah <laughs> That's um, some of my favorites and then uh the next one you'd have join your party i guess would be either grace or or it would be ignis. ignis i think it, dep- well, it, de- it depends, depends on yeah. how quickly you figure out um mm-hmm. how to how to get ignis in your party ignis is a a man constantly on fire ah sweet flames <laughs> and he really just does not seem to mind. And I don't like him. <laughs> uh, he's. I think he's the only evil party member. Mm-hmm. Yes, I yes, think he is. E- even even Anna, I think, is maybe chaotic neutral or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, Hope also. I didn't mean to cut you off earlier. You Go were kind of talking more about Anna as a character. She's like a what would you call her a, a Scottish tiefling? Yeah, like both she in has personality like a bit of like a, a Scot Scot Irish ish. Like voice acting, mm-hmm. um, and she's a tiefling, so she has like a tail. <laughs> mm-hmm. So she's a half demon, right? Yep, tieflings yep. Have, are. I guess tieflings are are tieflings always part human, or could you have perhaps like an orc or a dwarf tiefling? I think it seems like they're almost always humanoid. human. Yeah, any mm-hmm. humanoid race, I believe, we could could produce a uh, a tiefling, but they're almost universally kind of human in their appearance. That's why they're interesting because they do appear human. Who normally one of their strengths in these universes is that they fit in anywhere. A human mm. is pretty unremarkable, but uh, they have that demonic or devilish taint to them that marks them as other. And so tieflings usually- are like. Almost no matter where they are, not liked that much. It's it seems yeah. like in Sigil they're they're tolerated pretty well just because there's mm-hmm. creatures from all different planes. But at the very least on the prime material plane there's distrusted, uh, yeah. Yeah, they're they are distrusted due to their demon blood. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's definitely you definitely ha- hear other people say shit about her because mm-hmm. of being a tiefling. And she's really untrustful of everybody. Yeah. Pretty much everybody you meet, she's like, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I always have to be kind of like, it'll be okay. <laughs> probably. It'll be fine. Um, and then the next one you meet is probably Ignis. Yeah. And he is literally a man on fire, always. He doesn't seem to care. 
and he's truly evil, and I hate him. Yeah, he's the he's the only <laughs> he's the only actually evil party member. Mm-hmm. Um, but I tend not to use him because, uh, again, if I usually play the way I prefer to as a mage, it's kind of redundant having him mm-hmm. and Dakon in your party as well. You do actually meet him at the same time as Dakon, but um, again, kind of other requirements need to be met before you can actually utilize him as a party member. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you uh, meet him in the exact one, same bar. Yeah, he, he has one sort of arc to him that I would almost describe as mandatory. It's one of the most kind of significant, most important yeah. revelations that you can have. Um, he has a very interesting history as to how he ended up the way that he is. But once you have already explored all of that, I would consider him no longer necessary. Useless. And that's usually, yeah, I usually drop yeah. him at the time that I get Valor. Um, mm-hmm. You actually cannot have both of them for the final encounter. Um, not to get too heavily into spoilers or anything, but oh. uh, one of the two mm-hmm. will turn against you depending on your alignment. Yep. Since I we usually play as good. We have either my final thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of them did turn against us, though, due to our alignment. We still faced oh, him, yeah. Though. Yep. Yeah, he just, he has, like, the one interesting thing you sh- you need to, like, get from him, and then he's not then really Then you can drop yeah. him. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, yep. I will say, though, swapping out characters was mildly stressful for me. <laughs> because you leave them where you swap them out. Yeah, yeah. so well, so yeah. I had Ignis, and I, was, and I was like, okay, cool, all my character slots. And then we got Nordum. And I was like, okay, well, let's switch. But then if we like just left Ignis where Nordum was. <laughs> In the maze what? that you can no longer access once you leave it. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. what? So so, what? so we went back to like Grace's place. Her um, left the brothel. Him there. Yeah, her brothel essentially. Her and left him there. intellectual lust. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and left him there and then went and picked up Nordum. And I was like, all right, <laughs> you can <laughs> stay here, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think. Uh, Grace, you Grace, you could get before Ignis, and I think a lot yeah. of times you you would get Usu- her before. I, I before tend to. Ignis. Yep. I usually yeah. make a run for the for that for Just the brothel because, because it's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> because meeting her and going through her story gets her in your party, but mm-hmm. you kind of have to understand a pretty specific set of things to get Ignis, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they happen around the same time. So yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, let's touch on Grace. Through observation, sensation, and experience, the truth of the multiverse shall be revealed. She runs a brothel, a a non-sexual for the most part brothel, <laughs> where it is it's all about sensates, which is one of the the major factions in Sigil. Mm-hmm. And it's all about like the sensations that other people get to have through their life stories, right? Or well, it's about it's about experiencing as much of the universe as you can mm-hmm. and one of one of the ways they do it is by sharing experiences through sensory stones mm-hmm. and just by conversing with people yeah mm-hmm. intellect is a an incredibly important attribute or statistic while you're at that brothel um mm-hmm. the difference ex- the difference in experience that you'll have as like a, a dim-witted warrior as opposed to a, a high-minded mage is pretty enormous gulf between them and the brothel Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. I think I really liked being in the brothel because it was one of the only areas where it was like very female focused. There's a lot of like, it pretty generally skews a little more male for people that you're interacting with. So this part was all females generally. Um, and every everyone working at the brothel has like their own personality, their own story. There's like a bunch of little quests that you can do. There's like a bunch of a bunch of stuff that you can resolve and yeah. it, it all gets resolved by resolving other people's things and then coming back to like find out how these problems intertwine mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. there's yeah. a Romeo and Juliet like subplot that was really cute. Was <laughs> it Romeo and Juliet? I think they're literally they're named Romeo yeah. and Juliet. Yeah. <laughs> um and I thought that was really cute. And yeah, so Grace is um as we mentioned kind of earlier, she's a healer, but she's a succubus who doesn't seem very interested in being a succubus in any traditional way. Um I is there a way to read her diary? Because she won't let us. I never figured out how to do it. Charlie, have you read her I, diary? Mm, actually, I don't believe that I have. I, I think it's just like a, a piece of her inventory, correct? Mm-hmm. That you yeah. can interact with, but you can't actually like read the pages uh, before she swats her hand away. I, I don't believe you can. I don't think, you can, I don't think you can even open it. 
So, like, <laughs> e- even if you were to take it from her and take her from your party, I don't think you could open it without her opening it. Mm-hmm. Correct. You yeah. can ask her, and she was like, no. A lady must have her secrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you get some backstory on her, kind of more so hinted at, less so than told from her. We meet someone who runs a, like, an, a shop. A curio at- shop. Yeah. Um, which was one of my favorite places, actually. <laughs> and... Um, they kind of have like a history, the shop owner and Grace. And so you get a little bit of like Mm -hmm. that kind of backstory. You don't get enough, I think, on Grace. Do you remember what plane Succubi are from? Are they from Beator or? Yes. Uh, So you have demons and devils. Devils are Tanari from the Nine Hells or Beator. And demons are Beatizu. Hmm, That sounds backwards. I'm sorry. Yeah, they, they must be demons then. Um, Succubi, I think, are demons from the Abyss. And then Tanari uh, is their sort of D&D-esque name. Devils are the Beatizu from Beator. That would make the most sense to me, just based so on the name scheme. So she's like, tech, so they would be like from a hell scale, like a hell. One of the hells, yeah. There, there's a lot of hell dimensions. Mm-hmm. Are there only nine hell dimensions? One for, like, each... Yeah, there, there are nine nine layers of hell. I believe Beator is the first. Um, and kind of the, the general name for the plane, non-specific, uh, mm-hmm. Beator applies to hell, as you think of it sort of in the you know, like Christian mythology, whereas the abyss is just like countless you know, millions upon millions of layers, demon lords that all kind of vie for power over each other, whereas um, hell is more structured. They all kind of have a place that they respect. This is where their place is. They don't try and invade mm-hmm. other planes for instance whereas demons take every chance they can to uh, conquer another and mm-hmm. consume yeah some of the hells are very law like even though they're hells they're very lawful very organized very orderly as opposed to the chaos of like the abyss yeah yes cool. exactly okay that much i know and the, the blood <laughs> war features very prominently in this game yeah we haven't talked about it yeah, it's the millennia, like since the beginning of time, spanning conflict between devils and demons over essentially it's who's more evil than the other is the the beginning, like the crux of their conflict. It's just uh, a pissing a, contest. Basically, which is a good thing. <laughs> and, they, and they can't really die, right? As long as they die on their plane, they're just they're reborn. reborn. Yeah. yeah, and they just get reborn, go back to war. Yep, essentially. It's a never-ending struggle, which is a good thing because if they ever put their differences aside and kind of agreed to overrun the rest of the of the planes, they would very easily accomplish mm-hmm. that. So it's a good thing that they're just endlessly killing each other. <laughs> yep. Um, the next character we have, who we've mentioned before, is Nordum. I think, therefore I am. I think. Who is yeah, a... The next two characters are the most missable, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Yes, easily. Voiced by Homer Simpson. Yes, Dan we were just about to say. <laughs> <laughs> he sounds Dan exactly. Castanella, Casta, what's his last name? It's like Casadonetta. I'm not sure. Yeah, the, it. I, my I know spell, my to spell it, but I can't pronounce it. Yeah. 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 Homer um, Simpson. Yeah, it's Homer Simpson, and he has <laughs> his hands are like crossbows. And you're <laughs> like, what are you doing with those crossbows? He's like, what crossbows? <laughs> you're like, he's talking to him and stuff. It, it's he's. Really enjoyable. Yeah, actually, I he's, love a, him. he's a Modron, which is kind of like a robot, mm-hmm. and they kind of have this hive mind. The source. Yeah, if you get yeah. cut off from the source, from the hive mind, they fail to really keep themselves together, and it seems like he's been cut off for quite some time. Yeah, and he's just like, "I will work with you. I will mm-hmm. help you. <laughs> You're my new best friend." <laughs> I, I think that is one of the most endearing parts of the game. At Towards the end, uh, not to get too far into it, where he does kind of show humanity like a personality Mm -hmm. where all of your party members as they're, uh, I won't get too much into to that. Yeah, we we know we know the part you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, where yeah, you wouldn't really expect it from a mechanical, lifeless and soulless machine, but uh, there Mm -hmm. he is standing against the tide. Yeah, he's a good boy. Yeah, I really enjoyed having him in the party, mm-hmm. even though he doesn't, you know, he doesn't play into the plot as much as anybody else. He's not really giving you mm. massive background or stories. He's but still yeah. fun to have. He's fun. He's a good yeah. boy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then last is the one that I didn't get to meet. Yeah. So, so I'm a, we'll let out. you we'll <laughs> let you cover this one for the most part, Shutterly. Sure. Um, where do you find Valor? 
You have broken your word. You are a liar, a traitor to truth, and an enemy to all honest men. So he's easily missed. Uh, he is the last character you can come across, generally. Um, he is in the cursed prison. Yeah, you should be able to locate him before the final mandatory conflict, like an unavoidable combat, mm -hmm. one of the few in the game, uh, which is good because he is very combat-centric. He is a living, a living suit of armor with an enormous two-handed axe. I don't think you can separate him from it. Uh, but essentially, he is a suit of armor that once belonged to a man so devoted to his cause that even after death, he continues to serve that cause um which it feels plays... very um like dark souls ask like who's the Kinda. person yeah well like gundia ask yeah. yeah and it, it yeah. plays very prominently in your character's history um because it's it's Ooh. you that put him there in the situation that he's in um we are consistently assholes yeah you're, yeah we you're are previous incarnations pretty consistently assholes there's like one good incarnation and even he's not not great completely good <laughs> there were probably some good incarnations but were just unremarkable lived a normal life and then mm -hmm. yeah died and were promptly reborn into an asshole but yeah it seems like they, <laughs> they generally go that way they didn't make the history. ones that make name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And what is it? What well be well behaved incarnations rarely make history. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> um, so like the main question, the question of the whole game, even though initially you think it's just like, why are you cursed with immortality? Is really what can change the nature of a man? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A question that I think is uttered in the first minutes of the game with the end. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that is. One, a brilliant question to kind of mm -hmm. base it on and then make actually at some point make the make the player answer. Yeah, that's the mo one of the most powerful parts of the game. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, usually you have uh, a few dialogue options. You have like a lot. <laughs> yeah, for this one, you have so many you have so many dialogue options for your answer that you have to scroll <laughs> down to see them all. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all true. Like uh, Every one of them mm -hmm. in one way or another could easily I have a, a pronounced effect on a person, but there, there's generally one answer that kind of stands apart from the others. But yeah, all, every one of them. I kind of want to talk about one of each of our favorite moments in the game, if that's like fair without being too spoilery. Yeah, if we can do that without without yeah. like major spoilers. Yeah. Mine, I feel, is, is not mm -hmm. so spoilery, so at least I know I'm safe. Okay. Mine is when you go into a, the sensorium, where you can go and you can see all these like memories from different people in different places and it's yeah. like a mini mm -hmm. that's a really good part like the shortest of a short story it's just yeah it's like a bunch of short stories mm -hmm. where you're experiencing it from their point of view that's a really great part of the game that is that was i think my favorite part of the game hands down and that's not even really relevant to the plot at all that actually that's not relevant to the plot at all that that moment really some of some of them are plot relevant. Yeah, but, but like the big main, the the first main one we went into is well, the, okay, yeah. There's the public sensorium. There's mm -hmm. the private one. The private sensorium has more plot relevant stuff, but the, mm -hmm. the public mm -hmm. one, yeah, I don't, it's just there for fun. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, that's my that was my favorite like moment I think of the whole game. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. What about you, babe? I think the curio shop is really interesting. I love yeah. the curio like shop too. getting your hands on all the curios and mm -hmm. then finding out what most of them do. Mm -hmm. You know, because most of them have uses. We bought all of them. We bought all of them, and we found uses for almost all of them. Mm -hmm. One of them does play a part in summoning the Lady of Pain. There are <gasps> several yeah, ways to I, I get her. I assumed it had something to do with summoning her, but I don't really. Yeah. Is it the monster in a jug one? No, it's the, that was just the a monster in a no, jug. No, it's, right? it's a doll of the oh, Lady of right. Pain. That's I assume right. if you play with it too much, she <laughs> does not like it. <laughs> um. You can also play with like the little the little um I another thing I loved before Charlie's real quick is that you can get a pet Lim Lim, which is like a little it's a pet. Pio oh, that, that's, Pio, that's Pio. the companion that we didn't talk about. Oh yes. <laughs> you can have the him just elusive, hang out with you. The elusive sixth companion. <laughs> the Lim Lim. But you can like at some point we had him like 
covered like he turned in, we had him turn into like a little stone figure of himself he'd be and petrified could, like play yep. with him yeah mm-hmm. was it him we played with or was it like l- a little modron? you could play with the living one Love oh you. oh no yeah you're confusing that with the modron toy the little modron yeah toy. you can play with the modron toy and you do like very childish things with it yeah. and like mm-hmm. words like stop and you're like he doesn't like you very much <laughs> <laughs> it's it's before you figure out, like, how to unlock the Modron. You know, it's just, if you don't have any other options, well, your option is just to play with it like a toy. <laughs> what about you, Charlie? What's, like, your, like, favorite little uh, moments? I, I mean, without spoilers, it's almost impossible to... <laughs> That's um, Yeah, to really elucidate on it. But I would say the last 15 minutes of the game, you are confronted by... So it's not that that much of a spoiler to say you're confronted by three of your previous incarnations the mm-hmm. in your in your mind effectively the three of the strongest personalities that you have ever been across the millions of however many um uh, incarnations that you've had three bubble to the surface and you get to talk with each of them find out what they did and this is all stuff that you're you've already like learned throughout the game are things that you did but then to actually speak to the ones that actually are responsible for that and why they did the things they did um and then once it's all said and done you you get the biggest revelation of the game and something that i wish that i could experience again for the first time i know it's impossible mm-hmm. but uh if there's like a way that you could kind of reset your memory like drinking from the river sticks which plays into the game's theme sort of uh being able to experience and relive those last Five ten minutes, one more time. Um, that's that's my favorite video game experience of all time. That's great, yeah. And then the game ends. <laughs> yeah, you're mm-hmm. totally right. Because mm-hmm. um, that's yeah. that's when among among finding out, you know, why almost all the important stuff happens mm-hmm. in your previous incarnations. You also find out why you're immortal. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Again, kind of erring on the side of no spoilers um, to any of your listeners that do decide to play the game. Don't forget to get the Bronze Sphere. That's all all you need to know is to keep the Bronze Sphere with you to the end of the game. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, pretty much anything anything like that that you find that you think is important, just you have a lot of inventory slots between you and your allies. Just keep it on you. <laughs> <laughs> it's got some use to it somewhere. My most distressing moment beyond whenever that cutscenes would show up and I was not expecting a cutscene and I thought the game was breaking, is at some point, Mort gets stolen. <laughs> yeah. And I mm. was very upset. Like, he was like, well, let's just do this other little side thing. And I was like, um, no. Not, not without Mort. <laughs> what, yeah. Where is my skull? <laughs> <laughs> so, just, he, he just, yeah, he gets snapped. Like, someone takes him. It was, a, it was a skull mapping and it was not okay. <laughs> skull mapping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we ready for our uh, last thing we do? For the, yeah, is, I think that's just about all we can discuss without really getting too hard into spoilers territory. I'm we, sure we could talk mm-hmm. for a few more hours. Which the Easily. the saddest thing about not doing spoilers is that I think one of the most interesting... I mean, several characters that are really great are not going to be discussed, but mm-hmm. one of my favorite characters I think is most interesting. All right. Interesting. So the last thing we always do is we rate it. Um, one out of ten, and you can always explain your rating. Um, you want to start with Shutterly? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll say it's a 10. A couple of lip smacks there. And... <laughs> French, uh, uh, chef kiss, chef kiss. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's my favorite game, I think. Hard to say, because there's so many good ones, but between uh, Baldur's Gate and this... They... And System Shock, too. System Shock was good, but nowhere near the level of these two. <gasps> uh, they taught me more about myself than any other game has. They are the two that I will, I think the longest forever want to replay to, to revisit again. doesn't matter how old they are um, or how old I am. I'll always enjoy coming back to live in this world and interact with these characters. It's uh, it's really indescribable. Again, those last 10, 15 minutes, best experience of any video game I've ever played. I wish I could forget it so that I could experience it for the first time again. I definitely know that feeling for, mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. books and movies and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. I mean, even knowing it's coming at the end, it, it still gets you in some yeah. way. The, the impact yeah, is yeah. less sub- significant, but it's yeah, absolutely. Same. Yeah, it's it. It has a great overall story, a million great little stories, and then it it just it doesn't it doesn't drop the ball ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, it all flows together, and like the writers of this sort of game, they're 
they're few and far between. It doesn't seem like any game comes close to them, modern mm-hmm. speaking. Um, yeah, we, we need more games like that, though. Yeah. Just just fix the combat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one point, Ian, because we played together and Ian does all the walking, he was... It was when we were in the sensorium, one of my favorite mm. parts, and I was like, I just want to keep bringing these things. And he had read them, so he was going to go get, like, a drink or something. And I had to, like, walk the nameless one across a room, and I couldn't fucking do it. <laughs> the clicking is so weird and precise, and I was you have so to, angry. You have to click at a really precise part at, like, people's <laughs> feet to interact with them. It was very <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> All right. I'd played uh, Baldur's Gate before, so I was already well versed in, in clicking yeah. your feet and all that. So. And I mean, you yeah. get used to it really fast. Yeah, yeah. N- yeah. But I just I didn't know I, that the, just walking was going to become difficult. <laughs> and <laughs> suddenly, I was very frustrated. <laughs> all right, Ian, one out of ten. Um, I want to give it a nine point five or a ten, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I think realistically, with with how difficult it is just to interact with the game and combat and all that, I'd have to give it a 9 out of 10. That's fair. I'd ha- I have to dock it that full point for... Mm-hmm. Just because, I mean, you still have to play the game to get that. <laughs> yeah. It has 10 out of 10 content in it, but you still have to play that game mm-hmm. to get to it. So I give it a 9 out of 10. Yeah. I am going to be... I think I'm going to be at like an 8. Because, um, again, incredible story, all the good things, all the praises that we've said. Um, but also just like older games can be difficult and this is difficult in a, in a way that I could not walk. (laughs) 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 Um, so that's not the only, but like, but yeah, it should be stated that, yeah, you do get used to it. It Mm -hmm. it is clunky, but you get used to it by the end of the game. Mm -hmm. It's it's not frustrating to play anymore, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's worth docking it in my mind. It's worth docking a point for that. And for me, it's worth two because I'm as much as like my, one of my favorite games of all time is Bloodborne. I think the more accessible a game is, the better that game is in, in, in in a, in a way because it, yeah, if you, you, you if you if you can give yeah. accessibility without compromising mm-hmm. like the vision of the game, I like, think it would be worth. Yeah, doing. if we if we if you know if this is the best story told in any video game, which I th- I think it might be. Yeah, and I I think it's definitely hot, very high up there. I don't know for sure for me, but how many people aren't going to be able to play the game and give that incredible story because yeah, of a, the gameplay it, and stuff? And that's, that's frustrating. A tough sell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it should be noted though that. Um, the game has a lot of ports now. It's ported to, you know, it's, you know, Windows, obviously, but also Mac and Linux, but also uh, Android and iOS. You can play this on your phone? Yep. And tablet um, and all that. And so at this point, it, you kind of don't have an excuse to not be able to play it. Like you can get mm-hmm. it for like 10 bucks pretty much anywhere. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think the, the final thing to say is really just like, if any of this sounds interesting or if you're at all interested in this game, it's definitely worth a try. Yeah. Um, and then you can decide on your own whether or not the clunkiness of it or whatever is, is a, is a breaker, a deal breaker for you. Mm-hmm. But just know that it, 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 it is worth it. I mean, mm-hmm. it almost to, I would say to almost anybody, it would be worth it. So. Oh yeah. The destination is totally worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank mm-hmm. Charlie for joining us. He is the reason we played the game. Absolutely. Thank always you. Always a thank pleasure you. to talk Torment. Best game of all time. <laughs> um, so, as always, we will have another review coming up soon. Yep. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thank you for having me. Welcome back to a couple reviews. We're going to review another one of the older Godzilla films. This is the sixth film in the franchise. So some time has passed between our last one, which was the second, no, the third film in the franchise, right? Yeah, and now we're on the sixth. So a little bit of time has passed. We've watched the other ones in the meantime. This is Invasion of the Astro Monster in America. 
the when, little. And when I saw that title, I was almost certain that I was like mildly aware of what the Astro Monster was going to be, <laughs> but I was completely wrong. <laughs> uh, y- yeah. And then the literal translation from the Japanese actually means the giant monster war, which actually makes a lot more sense in the Astro Monster when you think about the plot. <laughs> So this is actually a Japanese-American collaboration between Toho, the Japanese company of Godzilla, and Mm -hmm. UPA. And this came out in 1965, but it didn't come to America until 1970. And when it did, it came out as a double feature with this film called The War of the Gargantuas, which is a kaiju Frankenstein film that is like a sequel to a different kaiju Frankenstein film. So he's like a giant Frankenstein? There's definitely kaijus in it and Frankenstein's in it. I didn't look more into it. The War of the Gargantuums is apparently kind of super, like, admired and beloved by, like, like Brad Pitt and, like, other Hollywood people. Why? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't look into it more because I was like, we might have to watch this. I don't want to be spoiled. <laughs> Couldn't be spoiled. I can't get I don't want to be ruined. So, like, there's something about Godzilla films, and I don't know if it was because of the time of filming, like, just the era that, like, the Chekhov's gun thing was very clear. Um, because we had that even in um, Godzilla versus King Kong, where early on we have that, like, string that's super strong. Oh, yeah. This one's exactly the same. Yeah. He makes a, a little a little box that makes a really loud noise. Yeah. Um, so early on we meet Tetsuya, which, of course, you and I the whole time were, like, making references to Akira. Tetsuya! Tetsuya! And he is the inventor of the thing that makes that high sound. And he calls it the Lady Guard. Yeah. Like, old school sound focused, like, mace. I think it's pepper just spray. Like, is, it, is it supposed to, like, deter the attacker? Or is it just, like, a really, really loud rape whistle? I don't know. In my mind, it was more like mace. But I think <clears> you are right. Maybe it is just, like, a really intense rape whistle. It's kind of cute. It looks almost like a little compact. Like, it's it's way more, like, chill to have on you, I guess, than a physical whistle. It looks like a uh, it looks like a smoke detector. But much, it's smaller than that. Not much smaller. It's not as thick, for sure. Not much smaller. Mm. Like a small smoke detector. Like a tiny smoke detector. But the problem, I guess, with using that would be that, like, with a rape whistle, it's, like, literally on you. But with this, like, it would be, like, in your purse or in your pocket, so you'd have to get it. And then activate it. So I don't know how good of a... It's not like you'd wear the whistle around your neck. I don't know. I think that's what you're supposed to do if you have a rape whistle, right? Or like on your keychain? I have no idea. Anyway. I I, I can only assume (laughs) that they don't work at all because nobody's going to go help anybody when they hear a whistle. They're going to be like, what's up with that whistle? That's true. And keep going on with their life. I mean, if we've learned anything from car alarms, it's that we all just get annoyed. Yeah. We assume someone's an idiot. <laughs> Have you ever once thought somebody's car is being broken into when you hear a car alarm? No. So, the this movie goes to space, which is an exciting new uh, thing for the Godzilla franchise. But it's 1965, which means that like we've been to space. We haven't landed on the moon. So, space race is like happening. So, which makes sense that, like... Japan is thinking about that when they're making movies. The technology that they're using in this movie, like quote unquote technology, because it's all props, is like far superior than what we had then. And you said one of the things that they do, like when they land, is like even more superior than like things we have now or what we've just had work, right? Yeah, we can make it work now with like computers. It's the reverse touchdown thing. I mean, we've been talking about that like ever since we invented rockets. It's like, what if they could bring themselves back down backwards? And rockets can do that now. But it's like, that's an idea that people have had, like, ever since rockets got invented. But way harder to pull off than we thought. Yeah, and it was, I don't know, as someone who doesn't know that much about science or space exploration, I'm, I'm always kind of interested to see things in every now. After Ian mentioned, like, oh, they did that, that reverse landing, we couldn't do that yet. I was like, what other things are they doing that is just theory? And they had, like, uh, this, like, little elevator where they climbed out of the spaceship and it, like, took them down one at a time. And I was like, I bet we don't have that. I bet we use stairs. Yeah, because, like, why would you not? And yet. But it's the future. Everything's tech. Well, the future, like, the year of the film that they tell you is, it's that it's, that it's 196X. So, like, they're only reaching, like, five years into the future at most. But I also, during this time, during, like, the 1960s, like, 
it's space all, stuff and Mars was massive. It's an alternate timeline. It has to be because those uh, they have like the astronaut suits on, but they just like push the helmet down over them and just slides on. And there's like yeah, it's like a motorcycle <laughs> helmet where it, like the visor flips up and down. Yeah, that would probably protect you against the vacuum of space. Just cute little pillows kind of around their heads to keep their like the helmet protection. It's cute. Our astronauts, because this is the uh, Japanese American collab, the two like main guys are an American named Glenn and a Japanese man named Fuji, and. Because it's a Godzilla movie, there has to be, like, a familial relationship happening. So, like, another main character is Fuji's sister. Yeah, you have to have the brother and sister character. Mm -hmm. And they must bicker. They must bicker. She must be interested in another man. Like, want to have a relationship with some guy. And he must not be into it. Yes. Um, So, her name is Haruno. H-A-R-U-N-O. But also, thankfully, kind of as another thing that happens a lot in Godzilla movies... Is that the woman isn't, like, she has her own agency to some extent, even though she's kind of under her brother's, like, thumb and patriarch almost. Um, Like, she has her own job. She works for a scientist who works with the, like, space, their NASA, (laughs) um, to send them to space. So she's, like, there for that. Um, Yeah, that's kind of the way the early, like, Godzilla and Mothra movies are. It's like, the women are kind of empowered, but kind of also it's still the 60s. Yeah. So, like, we can have jobs. They're not quite there yet. And they can, like, like a guy. But, like, we're never... I don't think we ever really see them kiss on anyone. We certainly don't have any prolonged kisses. I think we maybe maybe did in one of them. Maybe. And then also, the little women are still very much kind of, like, having to listen to their brothers. I'm assuming Fuji's older, and generally the brothers in these are older. But even still, as an only child, I cannot imagine someone I literally grew up with who was my brother no matter how much older he is, being like, you can't date so-and-so. Because I'd kill him. (laughs) So, but my favorite, uh, there's a lot of visual stuff that I love, and we've talked about that with Godzilla movies, like the miniatures are on point. This one is one of the weaker miniatures um, throughout the film, actually. There's a a few uh, seeing the strings moments. And I can only assume that's just because, one, they're reaching higher um, with the ideas, like, because of space stuff and floating, and also just no, the spaceship. I mean, but, like, some stuff is so good. I feel like the spaceship was, like, really well done. I mean, considering. It, it looked fine. Yeah. I mean, it kind of just looked like a very well-made toy rocket with space. True. Wallpaper in the background. We did get to, we did see, like, a few strings, and at one point, like, like a cord or someone's hair was, like, clearly in the shot of them in space. Like, just hanging out in, like, the top left what? corner. Yeah, you pointed out. You're like, is that the camera guy's hair? And I was like, I don't know what it is. But oh, it's- no, that was a hair stuck on the film. Oh, my God. You're right. Yeah. Um, that's great. 10 out of 10. <laughs> I guess we just, we don't have a better copy. Nope. Of the, of the, <laughs> of the, the digital versions going out also have the hair. Well, you gotta be real to the original. Yeah, can't can't be fake. Nah. But I, I really like how you you're introduced to Haruno. Which I'm going to stop saying because I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. So I just want to, I guess I'm calling her the sister, which is also taking away her power, but it's fine. Um, it's there. She's in the this big room with all these scientists, who, one of who's her boss, who is like talking to, through like a video camera, the two astronauts in space who are so far in space that they're like passing Jupiter to get to this little planet X behind it. So like, we certainly don't have that, I think, even still today. Probably that it far exploration. <laughs> we had high hopes. <laughs> um, but they're talking to them, and it's a sea of um, of all these uh, like scientists in white lab coats. But she's not a scientist. She's like his like secretary or something, or like his assistant. It's unclear what she is because later in the movie she does have a lab coat on. But I think that's because she's in like a lab environment in that moment, not because she is a scientist. I guess so. But you, so everyone else is in white, and she's in like a like color. And, like, so she stands out immediately because they also also kind of mention her and introduce her that way. I just thought it was a nice visual way to really, like, set her apart. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, let's cut the bullshit (laughs) and get right to the meat and potatoes of the movie. They fucking, they land on Mars. No, they land on Planet X. Planet X? They immediately split up, which is, I don't care if you're on an, it's never good. (laughs) I mean... That's not unrealistic. It's <laughs> no, it's not. Like, he goes to, like, 
I think he goes to plant the flag in a good mm-hmm. place, which is like three flags. It's the Japanese flag, the American flag, and another one we couldn't tell. Some flag that I don't recognize, and it could easily have been a made up flag for like that. That's their that fake yeah. NASA thing. Yeah. Uh, Fuji goes to do that. He comes back. Glenn is gone. The ship is gone, which is like. He seems more worried about Glutton, and that's fair. But also, your ship is gone? Yeah. That's and way harder to move. A little elevator tube comes up out of the ground. Like, <laughs> Very slowly, like, realistically. And there's, like, a, bu- there's a, bu- <laughs> there's a bunch of these little things coming out of the ground throughout the movie. Yeah. And they all have, like, fake rocks on top of them, or maybe real rocks in the movie. I don't know. But, like... It's just, like, everything the aliens have is just, like, built into the ground and, like, (laughs) comes up and down on hydraulics. It's amazing. And a voice tells him to get in the tube. He goes down and are introduced to the aliens, who are just people with, like, dumb outfits on. Uh, what are you talking about, just people? They have, like, helmets on. They're wearing hot couture outfits, (laughs) and and they have, like... They're fitted because there is some groin stuff happening sometimes. <laughs> Weird groin. Well, no, it's it's the way the pants are it's cut. It's very high up. It makes even it, on a... it makes it look like they have crotch bulges that go all the way up to their navel, <laughs> which yeah. is a good look. Ten out but of no, ten. they also wear like the those weird uh, sunglasses, kind of like Jordy LaForge. Looking, yeah. Except if Jordy LaForge was wore, a massive nerd, wore sunglasses instead of like yeah. his sight thing yeah and they're like we brought you down here we have your ship it's all cool we need your help fighting against monster zero and i'm like oh shit new kaiju space monster what's it gonna be we're lit and then they have like a video up top and they're like oh it's attacking and we look and you're like oh it's gonna be a new monster and then it's fucking king Ghidorah, who i know we haven't talked about on this podcast but king Ghidorah is a pre-existing character how does he get to planet x though how does he get to planet x <laughs> Can King Ghidorah just well, King Ghidorah, fly through space? I think King Ghidorah is, a, is an alien. Yeah, but can he fly through space at like at, fast enough to get beyond Jupiter? Apparently. Okay. I mean, they clearly didn't bring him in. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't saying Wait, they did. Wait, or did they? There's twist in this plot. Dun, dun. And so they're like, we want you here. We brought you here because we know on Earth, our monster X, who you call King Ghidorah, and I'm like, it's just King Ghidorah, don't give this monster an onion, whatever, fought your other kaiju, Rodan, and his best friend Godzilla, our main hero, um, before, and they won. (laughs) Can we borrow your monsters? We'll give you the cure for cancer. Yeah, that's the setup for this movie. That's a high stakes. (laughs) If you give us Godzilla and Rodan, we'll give you the cure for cancer. They don't even really like Godzilla and Rodan yet because they they kind of fuck shit up frequently. Like they're not heroes, really. They don't want them, but it's it's just wild (laughs) that like the bar is already so high. I feel like I feel like you could have offered the 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 nation of Japan or even the whole world, and I think Japan really owns them and would have to be the one to deal with this. A lot of things. The cure for cancer is not where I thought it was going to go. I mean, that would be great. So they're like, we'll tell our people. <laughs> but w- one thing that we both noted was, like, if this was a modern movie, there would be a main character with cancer. Uh-huh. And it would be, like, a personal, like, struggle. Or, or like, their parent. Like, Fuji's yeah. mom would have it. Um, yeah. And whereas with this, it's like, we want the cure for cancer because it's cancer. And yeah, it's, it kills it's, people. <laughs> it's, it's good for everyone. It's not a personal it doesn't vendetta, have to like, be, thing. Yeah. Yeah, so the aliens who are called like Zillions, X I L I E N S, on the Wikipedia, which is not said in the film, Ian has the script and he like scrolled through to try and find what these are called in the movie. I control F. Yeah, but still. X I L or whatever. I didn't Um, see it, but. But so, yeah, Uh, but their leader is called the controller, and that's kind of the only person, really the only alien that talks to them, uh, excluding like one female. That talks to the humans. So they're like, we're going to go back to Earth and talk to our people. We'll get back to you. (laughs) So as we said, they want to borrow Rodan and Godzilla because they already beat King Ghidorah. But can we briefly recap the moment of them fighting King Ghidorah? They were fighting each other. It was childish. And then uh, Mothra, my queen. Oh, from the previous movie. Yes. From the previous movie. Where they first fight King Ghidorah. Mothra, my queen, shows up and is like, Y'all stop fighting. We got to get rid of King Ghidorah. He's a dick. And they were like, not until the other one apologizes. 
And she's just like, fuck this. And she goes to fight him and she gets her ass whooped. And then, <laughs> and then one of my favorite things that Godzilla has, will ever do is he goes to save his lady love. And by doing that, she, she bites onto his tail and he drags her up this mountain to safety. <laughs> but like, why, why is it Mothra part of this team to bring in? I guess because she got her ass kicked and didn't. She did her string stuff, I think. I don't even know if she's currently a moth or a larva. That is that is legit, actually, because she kind of cycles through. She yeah. could be a moth. She could be a larva in this current time. Mm-hmm. But it's a movie. They can do what they want with her character. Like, whatever. Yeah, they can do whatever. I was just slightly insulted that Mothra got left behind. She's not exactly, like, the best fighter. She can spray goo. Mm-hmm. She's mostly just pretty and a goddess. And I think she can flap moth dust down yeah like wind power no not just wind i think like she can drop dust off her wings what does the dust do i don't know Hmm. don't remember Hmm. it's either like poisoning or paralyzing but anyway yeah (laughs) of course they take the deal they drag rodan and no godzilla they agree to the deal and then the aliens whose spaceships are very like they're flying saucers but they're not like they're very rounded uh, all the way around. Like, there isn't that kind of tapered on the ends of a flying saucer where you traditionally think of them. They feel very, I don't know, like, squat to me. Yeah, the little squat little mushroom cap flying Everything is saucers. very, like, rounded in the alien world. Also, their doorways, <laughs> the doorways in the, like, underground compound is shaped kind of like a piece of bread where uh, it kind of comes like, up and it pans like up. Of, their hallways are loaves of bread. And every time I saw it, I was just like, when we first thought, before we saw the aliens, I was like, are they going to be French toast people? Like, what are these aliens going to look like? Oh, my God. And they were just fucking people. That's in, fine. In rad outfits. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, obviously, they agree. But, yeah, there's a little fuckery, but it doesn't really matter. Like, no. uh, the aliens were already there, and they were going to take them whether you said yes or no, but that's not really plot relevant. Yeah. So, uh, then... They, they t- take them to they take them through space in bubbles and the alien and the and, and just drop them on the planet. Godzilla and Rodan were like asleep, and then they stay asleep the whole time they're there. They're like curled up cuties, and then they just kind of gently drop them on Planet X, and they wake up and they're both like, "What?" And I was like, "Me too." Though I would also actually I would be more upset. <laughs> and then I don't even know they don't even. I don't even know what happens then, right? I, I, doesn't Ghidorah just uh, show up out of nowhere and start trying to whoop their ass? Yes. I think it, yeah, it's apropos of nothing. They stand up, they're all confused that they're on a, another planet, and Ghidorah just shows up, and they start duking it out. So, here's my here's my question that could be, like, ignorance or a plot hole. Later it will be revealed that, like, they can control King Ghidorah, right? And they also will use the same power to control Rodan and Godzilla. But, like... Does that mean this whole time they've been controlling Ghidorah? So, like, he only attacked, like, quote-unquote attacked when they knew the the um, this astronauts were there to see, and then he I only don't... attacked to fight them? Do they really even have this problem? Because we know, we find out, they only really want Earth. They don't even care about our monsters as much. They really only want Earth. They want to own Earth because they're out of water. Yes. Yeah, it's that whole plot line. But, like, w- what would be the purpose... What was the purpose of bringing Rodan and Godzilla to Planet X to start off with if they're just going to bring all three of the monsters back and control their minds? If they've had the opportunity to do that the whole time, why didn't they just bring Ghidorah and start controlling all three of their minds? That's legit, but then why are they afraid, like pretending to be afraid of Ghidorah and living underground if they can control Ghidorah? Because it doesn't seem like they just acquired like, this it's, technology. It's just another layer of shit that doesn't add up and doesn't make sense. There's no answer to this hope. I'm slightly upset about it. I expect what? higher quality. <laughs> what? You're going to tell me that the Godzilla subplot's not up to par? Can't believe you're even talking about this and not the fact that Godzilla gets to kick space rocks at his enemies. Now. Our favorite move. And Rodan flies up really high with a boulder and drops it on Godzilla. Yeah. Godzilla taught his his bro, Rodan, the move essentially with Rodan, Rodan's version of it, of kicking rocks. Kicking rocks. <laughs> um, that is good quality monster fighting. <laughs> Also, like, the whole time the astronauts are like, I don't know about these these aliens, to each other. And I'm like, maybe tell your superiors who are, like, sending our monster, whatever. No, I just don't see that happening. I guess not. Then there's just hopping around. There's another bizarre side plot where Glenn's love interest on Earth. Oh, yes. 
is actually one of these many, many clones from Planet X. Every, all, yeah, every all the woman, women look like her, or she is. Yeah. They all look alike. Every woman on Planet X is this copy of these women. Yeah, and she's just one of them sent to Earth to like help out with the ha- aliens yeah. that are on Earth. Yeah, but she falls in love with Glenn. But also, Glenn is the the American astronaut. Uh, she is also like trying to buy or has paid money for the lady guard because spoiler alert that sound is what will like destroy them and is obviously like the Chekhov's gun of the whole film which mm-hmm. I immediately called the moment we saw it and you were like well obviously um, and I was like so they're buying that technology and then we see like her boss who was later real to be an alien also like burn the like the the blueprints yeah so. and I'm like yeah but he still knows how to make it you didn't kill the inventor <laughs> He even still has one. He, that yeah, he, he has around. one with him. And like the 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 girl tragically gives her life, but before she does, she passes on a message to Glenn that's written down. And it it's I I wish I knew exactly how it was written because it was something vague like sound our, is our weakness. Our, or we something. we have a weakness to sa- to a sound. Yeah. I think it was specifically a sound. And I was like, cool, but like, and they, that is not enough help if you're going to give your life. <laughs> and they instant, when they read that, they instantly know that it's the lady guard. That's yeah, the weak point. there's some issues. So they just go around <laughs> squeaking the fucking because, alarm at them. Because the aliens have, re- oh, so the aliens gave them the cure to cancer on like a large audio reel. Oh, that's right. They to bring them back to America. I want like a direct, a, immediate yeah, it, thing for cure cancer. They didn't give cancer. them a blueprint. They gave them a fucking audio cassette that had, <laughs> they said had the cure of cancer. And they it were like, didn't. okay. It came in a gold box. Yeah. So it just, ha- it just had their announcement that they were uh, invading <laughs> Earth on it. <laughs> and that they could control all the monsters. And like, thanks for the monsters. I guess they wanted the monsters to control Earth. That's how they win the fight. Although I guess why? No, yeah, they were but why use, did they need to bring them? They were using back? the monsters. Yeah. To, but why would they bring them to their planet and then send them back? You're right. That just seems wasteful for gas or whatever they use. Or just wasting their time. Yeah, very time just consuming. Convoluted plot. We know even, that their their spaceships go very just, quickly, like oh, almost light light speed, but like still time. They are at one eighth of light speed. Still time. Oh, one of my favorite moments is when the humans are like leaving with the cure from can- with can- cure for cancer. They like look out the windshield of the spaceship or whatever, like the camera, I guess, and they see Rodan and Godzilla looking up at them all dejected <laughs> <I love laughs> because they're moment. being abandoned. And Fuji's like, "Should we feel bad?" <laughs> I actually do like that moment. It's just like that moment of like super self awareness as they just watch them take <laughs> off. Like, wait, what? what? <laughs> we live here now. Because I was like, there is no water on this planet. I love to be in the water. It's where I sleep. Rodan and likes then they rocks. immediately start getting their ass kicked by Godzilla. And then they, no, they, they've already beaten him. Really? Yeah. No, I thought it was No, like they right beat before. him. And then they get the cure for cancer and then they leave. And, and like, Godor is somewhere else hurt. And the, our boys are just like, you leaving us? You doing <laughs> that? That, that right might now? be true. I don't even fucking remember what happens with the rest of the movie. <laughs> they just screech the alarm at them, right? Yeah, they screech. They like obviously at one point the military has to come in to like defend against the monsters. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. They make um, as propos of all Godzilla films. Military yeah, they, is here to help. they make a um, they make trucks that shoot that sound. Yeah, and like, they, like big satellites, but you can oh, like see the sound waves. That's right. No, no, it doesn't make the sound. It disrupts the fields. That control the monsters. Yes, and then the sound is used through all the radios that tells. There's that's like an announcer right. that's like, "Citizens of Japan, I know the sound is going to be awful. Turn up your radios." Yeah, <laughs> and they play they play the lady defender or whatever lady, lady guard, guard sound through all the radios in Japan, which does sound awful. I don't. And it fucks up it fucks up all the aliens, and then they use the trucks to disrupt the mind control. Yeah, <laughs> King Ghidorah does. Does King Ghidorah come back to Earth with them? I don't remember. I can't remember either. We definitely get our two boys back and, like, fuck King Ghidorah a little bit. I'm sure he'll show up later. Like, he how definitely we, will show up later. How do we not even remember how the movie ends? I feel like there's a lot of... I feel like this every time we watch a Godzilla movie. There are moments I fucking, like, lose my mind. I think about I love them fucking leaving our boys behind the way we're introduced to the sister. Like, moments are so good. Like, the bread doors are hilarious. But then, like, the, the overall, like, plot... 
And like what happens? Wait, hold up. Really goes away. Are you trying to tell me that you don't think that this was a good film? That is not what I said. <laughs> Do not put words in my mouth. Here's what I think Japanese Godzilla films tend to do very well. And it's that, like, you see the monsters early in the film, whereas in all American films, I feel like a lot of the times we save them. as like a, ooh, what are they going to look like? But we all know. Um, so you get what you're paying for to come see, right? The kaiju. But at the same time, there's human characters and human interactions that you are interested in, or you're, or you're like, confused about enough to be interested in. Like, when did Glenn even meet this woman? <laughs> Why are they together? Why is she willing to, like, literally, like, die for him? Yeah, I, I can't say that the human plot lines in these Godzilla movies are any better than, like, the American Godzillas of the past few years. I feel but like they're, they're certainly more interesting. interesting just because they're fucking bizarre. Yeah, they're more interesting. There's more, and there's, there's, you, there's always more characters. Like, there's, like, it's almost like an ensemble cast of both, kai, in this one, both kaiju and, like, people and... Even if the human story isn't, like, driving you forward, you need to know what's going to happen, and blah, 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 and, like, you know the aliens are shady. Enough weird shit is happening that you're like, yeah, I'm going to see how this goes. Yeah, you kind of just, like, for the most part, like, just chill and let let the movie take you on a weird ride. You're not trying to figure out any, like, secrets. <laughs> it's not a mystery film. It's not something where you have to, like, cl- put all the clues together to you're figure it out. You're not emotionally attached to, like, <laughs> you're anything. You're not em- emotionally attached to anybody. <laughs> I really thought when, when we first saw the movie, and I think I told you this, when we first saw Glenn, I was like, oh, no. Is Glenn, the because I didn't know this was a collab with America, I said, is Glenn the token black guy from horror films? When he, is he going to die? I did think Glenn was going to die. Yeah. Because he's, the, like, he's the, like, the one white guy in the entire movie. Yeah. And then... He did not. He lived to the end. He had a great time. Well, not a great time. The, like, woman he loves is dead. But <laughs> he's a, he's physically fine. Oof. You feel? Oof. Uh, so how do we... How do you want to rate uh, fucking Invasion of the Astro Monster? I'm going to give it somewhere between a 2 and an 8. All right, you're going to need to narrow that down way more. <laughs> it's a 2 film that I like like a 7. <laughs> That's really harsh. I don't think it's a two. Okay, it's a three film that I, I like. Like a seven. <laughs> I think it's enjoyment eight. I had a great time. You 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 were with me. I was having a great fucking time. Just I, we, tearing it to shit. We always have a great time when we watch <laughs> these movies. Like yeah, we have we we do enjoy them quite much. The f- actual film, I'm gonna go like a five because I think it's just it it's fine. Like none of the acting is so glaringly bad. Although there are some weird moments. And but like, how do we? How would you know? We don't speak Japanese. Well, yes, but I guess I guess I never looked at their face when emotion was supposed to be this emotion, and it was like the opposite. <laughs> at the very <laughs> least, that didn't happen. Yes, I'm, I'm stick. Yeah, I'm I'm good with like a five. My my enjoyment of the film, watching it, having a good time with you, eight. We're we're not far off. I'm just shifted like one or two points down. Mm-hmm. You're harsher than me. Hopefully we'll see. If you like Godzilla movies, this is yet another one you gotta watch. I mean, you you gotta watch them all. Yeah. There are ones that are, I think, just not good. Yeah, actually, The Return of Godzilla. Godzilla 2. It's fucking garbage. Just, yeah, you skip that one. Yeah, you just skip that. You don't need it. You skip right It's unimportant. But yeah, thanks for listening. Please leave a comment and like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It always helps us out with visibility. Bye. Bye.